everyone, and welcome to episode 140 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabelski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. As many of us have been reminded by hot takes in the media lately, after the Black Death, there was more than one uprising that occurred in Europe. The most famous, perhaps, is the Peasants' Revolt, which happened in England in 1381. But it was in 1358 that the French peasants took everyone by surprise, rising up suddenly against the nobility in an unprecedented and remarkably coordinated revolt. While modern opinion writers may point to direct and simple connections between the Black Death and the peasants' rebellions in order to make predictions about our own times, the truth is, of course, much more complex, challenging, and interesting. This week, I spoke with Dr. Justine Fernhaber-Baker about the French uprising that shocked everyone, the Jacquerie. Justine is a senior lecturer at the University of St. Andrews, where she works on late medieval France, power, violence, and law. She's the author of many essays and publications on revolts, including her first book, Violence and the State in Languedoc, 1250-1400, and her latest book, The Jacquerie of 1358, A French Peasant's Revolt. Here's our conversation on why the people rose up against the nobility in 1358, how the legal system dealt with the uprising, and why the Jacquerie is much more complicated than we may realize. Well, thank you for joining me to talk about the Jacquerie. I think this is both a really interesting subject and pretty timely because I think this is something that people are starting to bring up now. So thanks so much for being on the podcast. Oh, I'm really delighted um, to be invited. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So set the scene for us. Okay, so we're talking 14th century, which is a century full of disasters. We're about to have an uprising in France. Set the scene for us. What's going on in France at this time? Okay, so it's um, the Chakri starts the the first day, the first event is the 28th of May, 1358. Now, the 1350s in France had been an awful decade, not just because of the plague, which hits France in the winter of 1348 and kills somewhere between a third and half of the population just in that first wave, but also because of the Hundred Years' War between France and England, um, where you have the English king claiming the French crown, mostly because he wants free reign in the southwest of France, his county there, but he does actually have a claim. Now, what I think a lot of Anglophones don't understand about the Hundred Years' War is that war was between France and England, but it was fraught mostly on French soil. The war had been going on since 1338, and it had gone very, very badly for the French. And the most disastrous moment had come just a couple of years before the Jacquerie in September 1356 at the Battle of Poitiers, when not only had the French forces been cut to shreds, but also the king, John II, had been captured on the field and was being held for ransom in London for far more money than France could afford to pay. The knock-on effect of the war was both very high level of taxation to pay for the armies, but still the crown was broke because war is very expensive. And with the Black Death, the tax base had kind of disappeared. So there's that sort of general misery going on. And then you have um, some very acute circumstances that lead directly to the Jacquerie, because with the king captured away in London, the government devolves on his 18-year-old son, Charles, who will later be known as King Charles the Wise. But as an 18-year-old, he was not very wise. (laughs) Quite the opposite. (laughs) And he was kind of torn in two directions, one by the kind of old-fashioned nobles who had advised his father but also by a reform faction led by the head of the Parisian merchants, a man named Etienne Marcel, and also the Bishop of Lyon, Robert Lecoq. And they really wanted to reform the government. They wanted to reform the way that taxation was done to make it more equitable so that nobles didn't seem to always be escaping taxation out of these tax loopholes. They thought they could run the the army better. So these two factions were vying for power. And in February 1358, so three months before the Jacquerie, this rivalry comes to a head. 
And Etienne Marcel, the head of this reforming faction, the Parisian merchant, has two of Prince Charles's counselors, noble counselors, killed in his bedroom before him. And it's so violent that blood actually splashes onto the prince, right? And this is this basically the noble faction considers this a declaration of war, and they get the prince on their side. And then they garrison castles on two of the three rivers that supply Paris, sort of cutting it off. So the first event in the Jacquerie, anyway, actually really has to do with that blockade of Paris and the military circumstances and keeping the last river supplying Paris open and free from those noble garrisons. So that's what's going on. So there are a lot of big long-term things going on with the Black Death and also very short-term acute circumstances like who's in that castle there and where are those guys going? Are they going to garrison that other castle? Right. And I think that it's important to take that time to explain the background of it because it is, it's almost a slow, you could almost call it a slow burn at first. You have the reformers mm -hmm. and you have the prince and they're kind of eyeing each other starting this blockade. But then when the Jacquery hits, it's pretty quick. So it's kind of like a powder keg that's been ready. And then there's a spark that lights it. So what is what happens? What's the spark that lights this powder keg? Okay, so what happens is on the 28th of May, a group of noblemen come riding down a road that leads to the Waz River. And this road runs through some villages where the villagers note that this is happening. And so a group of villagers from these villages assembles and they meet up with the nobles at the village that leads across the Waz. What seems the most likely explanation is that they think these nobles are headed for a castle reachable on the other side at a place called Cré, which is about a mile and a half, maybe three miles up the river. You can walk between these two places. I've done that. Cré is the castle that is analogous to the other castles on the other two rivers that are blockading Paris. If you're going to blockade the Waz, Cré is where you would do it. So we can never be 100% sure, but this is the most obvious explanation that fits with the evidence we have. We have no evidence that the nobles attacked first. And there was also some symbolic value in attacking this group of nobles because it was being led by the nephew of one of the noblemen who had been killed in the prince's bedchamber three months before. So this is the first moment, and we can say that the Jacquerie begins in this village on the 28th of May with the massacre of these noblemen. That definitely sparks the revolt, but the revolt that follows after that massacre is actually quite different in terms of its violence, in terms of what we can glean about its objectives. It's also not clear whether, it's clear that that massacre served the interests of the Parisian reforming faction. What is not clear is that they orchestrated it. And in fact, it looks like it caught them a little bit on the back foot. First of all, because the next day on the 29th of May, the reform faction executes the crown's master of the rivers, and also its master carpenter. And these are these these are both things that that dovetail exactly with what people were interested in at that first massacre, keeping the river open. But the village that they attacked in is also a big quarry village and a source for the stone for building things. So they don't that they don't do that execution until the next day suggests that they got this news and went, oh, okay, we see what was going on there. And then while the Parisians eventually do join with the Jacques, it takes them like five or six days to get their army together. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't look like they were expecting it. Yeah. And part of the 
impetus behind the book, I think, is you're finding that there are all sorts of different reasons for people to have participated in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like this happened and everyone thought, oh, now's our moment. This is our time to do <laughs> to rise up. Yeah, I think a really important thing to realize about the Jacquerie in particular, and maybe about large scale movements like this in general, you know, whether it's an anti war movement or a riot or any other medieval revolt, is that they don't usually mean just one thing to their participants. People are not motivated by only one objective. In the Jacquerie, we can identify some objectives, but you know, nobody ever laid out a manifesto for the Jacquerie, right? We have some reports of what people said here and there, and some of them kind of mesh. And we have, you know, chroniclers attributing causes to the Jacquerie, which also sometimes kind of overmesh. But you know, this is a movement that was made up of Certainly thousands, probably tens of thousands. One chronicler claims 100,000. I don't think that is true. Mm -hmm. um, but lots and lots of people. And they didn't all know what was going on. And it went on for, you know, a period of weeks. So what they thought they were doing at one point might have been different from what they thought they were doing at another point. You really have to, to understand it as big and messy and changeable. Mm -hmm not seeking to put it into a single box because that just wasn't what it was. Yeah, exactly. So it's named after ordinary people. Why is it named the Jacquerie? Where does that name come yeah. from? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the men involved in the revolt, and I think probably particularly the ones who were more involved organizationally and, and who traveled around a lot to kind of making things work. They were called by other people, but I think also called themselves Jacques Bonhomme, which, you know, sort of literally translates as James Goodman. But Jacques Bonhomme was a nickname that had been given to common born foot soldiers in the French armies of the Hundred Years War over the past five or 10 years. And it was originally meant by noblemen as a sort of derisory thing. But it does seem that commoners actually took this name up for themselves as a, as a proud thing. And particularly after the Battle of Poitiers, which was really blamed on the cowardice of nobles running away, not protecting their king, it was commonly felt, and, and we have a, a satirical song about this, that if only the crown were to trust in his common-born troops, his Jacques Bonhomme, things would be different. And people felt this particularly because the king had actually dismissed a lot of his foot soldiers, a lot of the Jacques Bonhomme, before the Battle of Poitiers. So it, it very much comes out of both the Hundred Years' War, the circumstances of the Hundred Years' War, but also this sort of sense of commoners that not only were nobles not doing their jobs, but they themselves could take up roles that had been traditionally reserved for noblemen. You know, it is a sort of, I don't know if it's a class consciousness, but it is certainly a, a sense of pride in their identity. Yeah, I think that's important to think of it as identity, right? This is the identity mm -hmm. that we're taking on. And I think it's important to think of it because it seems to have been for most of the people an anti-noble revolt. And mm -hmm. as you're saying, the, the blame is being placed on the nobles for not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So they have this kind of agreement between people that we will work for you and you will take care of us. And the Hundred Years War is going disastrously. There are the free companies wandering around just ravaging the country. So you can see why people will be a little bit upset about it. Yeah. And I think, I think that's an interesting thing there too, because even even that very clear sense that this is an anti-noble revolt. Pretty much everybody agrees, pretty much the sources agree that it's anti-noble and pretty much everybody involved agrees that it's anti-noble. But whether they mean anti-noble in a very broad social sense or whether they're thinking particularly of the nobles around the prince, around the crown as a political class and the this is a time when the three estates of France, the clergy, the nobles, and the townspeople are meeting to, you know, discuss the affairs of France. And 
it's the townspeople who really, in the three estates, who end up really facing off against the nobles. And they end up meeting separately over the course of the spring of 1358. So there's a more restricted sense of anti-noble, as well as this much broader sense, which probably in some ways explains both the organization of the revolt, but also its attraction for such a wide array of people. Yeah, I do want to get into organization in a minute because I think that's important. But one of the things that you mentioned in the book that I thought was quite fascinating that really speaks to the psychology of the people, I think, is that they were upset against nobles generally. And one of the things you mentioned is that they are really about destruction of property. It's more than hurting people. It's mostly about hurting property. And Mm. that most of the examples that you found people are not actually attacking their own lords. Mm. (laughs) And can you tell us about that? Because I think that's really fascinating. You'd think that, you know, if you're going to rise up, you're going to take over your own lord's property, but that's not what you saw happening. Yeah, well, I think that speaks to sort of the way in which people are thinking about nobility as more of a social and cultural phenomenon, which is different from how they're thinking about lordship, which is more political, judicial. They're upset about nobles' tax exemptions. They're upset about really nobles' aesthetics. There's a lot of complaint about how nobles are swanning around in feathered hats and um, how noblemen are are wearing these trousers that don't leave much to the imagination. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's the 14th century for you. <laughs> but, you know, it's very easy. And I, th- I think this actually speaks somewhat to the issue of polarization, which is often why you get a massive uprising that, that ends in a lot of destruction is polarization beforehand. It's very easy to demonize people you don't know. It's much harder to say, oh, well, William... We know William. I mean, he's the Lord. Yeah, he's the Lord. But, you know, he's been really helpful sometimes. And he comes to dinner all the time. He's my daughter's godfather. I remember William when he was little himself. You know, that that sort of personal relationship, I think, accounts for some of it. And I also think that, again, making that distinction between lords, and particularly one's own lord, and nobles is important. You owe things to your own Lord, and you get that sermon in church. Nobles swatting about, there's no justification for that. Yeah, I think that's super important for both of those reasons, the judiciary reason and the interpersonal reason, because these people did actually have contact with their lords, and they knew what they looked like. And it's one thing to be upset at nobles, and it's another to look that person in the face and destroy their property or hurt them or threaten them. It's a totally different thing. Yeah. We were talking about organization, and I think this is really fascinating as well. So first of all, there is this uprising, which may or may not have been organized on the day that it first happened, this massacre of the nobles. But immediately, people start to organize. So how how do they organize themselves in this revolt? Okay, so before the massacre, there is some sort of assembly. But it's not clear that there was any leadership, any formal leadership at that assembly, which might seem kind of surprising, but actually a lot of revolts start that way. The English peasants' revolt started that way. It starts acephalously without a leader, and then they get a leader. And that's also common for village assemblies in this part of France, that you just assemble without leaders. But then after the massacre, there is a second assembly. And that's where they choose a leader and they choose him. They don't have him imposed upon them, though he obviously, he does have people, it seems like canvassing, you know, the assembly saying, you know, this guy, his name was Guillaume Cal. Guillaume Cal would be a great guy. You know, he's educated. He's been a soldier. He's married. He's a respectable, upstanding man who knows what he's doing. Put Guillaume in charge. Mm -hmm. And then Guillaume Cal also has, we can tell he has a a circle of what's been called his top brass. So he's got a lieutenant and he's got messengers who go out and talk to other leaders of the revolt. Because it seems like in many villages, 
maybe not all of them, but certainly in many villages, each village elected its own village captain. And these captains, some of them even had subordinates. So sub-captains, or one had a man who was in charge of a um, division of 10 men. So maybe he had several of these people. So there's this kind of skeleton of named organizational leadership. But it's also very grassroots because all of these people are elected. There are one or two cases where it looks like Guillaume Cal sent a captain to a village, but most of the time these people are elected. Sometimes they say against their will, but of course they would say that. Of course they would, because many of the sources you're using are from legal documents trying to make them look like they're not guilty, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a really important thing. You know, everything we have from the Jacquerie was written after the Jacquerie. When everybody already knows that the movement has failed, also the rebellion in Paris has failed, everybody is trying to save their skins. So, you know, you have to read with a lot of cynicism. Although also the thing about these legal documents, most of which are actually royal pardons. So these are, these are people who are actually sort of escaping punishment, kind of. The stories they told in those pardons about what they did had to be true because they were going to be checked before a judge. Mm. And we do have some records of investigations of not the Jacquerie pardons, but other pardons where, you know, they called witnesses. And if it turned out you'd lied, well, then your pardon was no good. And since these things were expensive and kind of a pain to get, you would have wasted a lot of time and money doing this. Mm -hmm. Well, it's important always to be aware of the sources, as you say, what's the bias in there? What's, what's the aim? So we're kind of giving a bit of a spoiler already, but what happens? So we know that the Jacquerie is pretty short lived. The peasants mm -hmm. rise up and then what happens? Yeah, it is quick. By the 30th of May, so just two days after, they're already organized enough and massive enough to organize the execution of a traitor to the cause just a couple of miles down the Waz River and for Guillaume Cal actually to have sat in judgment of this man. And there are like 200 people who witnessed this execution. So, so things are moving quickly. And a few days after that, there's a squire who's executed so they're moving quickly and they're doing things like burning down houses, tearing down small castles. But then probably about the 6th or 7th of June, the Parisian army comes out and joins them. And they march first toward one of these castles on the Marne River at a place called Mo. But along the way, they join up with the Jacques, they press some villagers into this army, they attack the castle of Etienne Marcel's hated brother-in-law, who's like very high in this noble faction, but who also built Etienne Marcel for part of his wife's inheritance at one point. <laughs> so... Some of the Jacques end up joined up with the Parisian army and attack Mo on the 10th of June. Mo is like this chivalric spectacle because the castle is guarded by, I don't know, a dozen noblemen. And the prince's, the crown prince's wife and baby and his sister are inside. And the baby's a girl too, right? And lots of nobles, especially noble women, have fled to the castle at Mo. So this huge mass, you know, probably, I don't know, maybe 10,000 strong of combined commoners from Paris and from the Jacquerie's armies converge on this castle and they're cut to pieces. The castle is very hard to take. It's on an island in the middle of, of the river. You can only get to it by a little bridge. And so it's very easy to defend. And once the battle starts going badly, their ranks break, they're chased out into the field and slaughtered like pigs, as one chronicle has it. But this defeat is then compounded because another contingent of Jacques faced off 
against the King of Navarre, <laughs> um, who is not yet um, entered this conversation, but was himself a claimant to the French throne and actually a friend of the reforming faction. But when the Jacquerie broke out, some nobles had ridden to the King of Navarre and said, look, we're being killed just for being nobles. Would you please help us? <laughs> And the King of Navarre, who's also named Charles, said yes, although probably the price he exacts is that these nobles will then not fight against him when he decides to attack France later on that summer, which is just something we shouldn't get involved no, with no. because it's too complicated. <laughs> but so Charles of Navarre, who is a very, very good fighter, and this is why many people in France actually thought he might make a better king than King John, who gets himself captured. <laughs> so the Jacques are not sure what to think about the King of Navarre because he's been friends with the Parisian faction and they've done their service for the Parisian faction and, and so shouldn't they be friends? And so when the King of Navarre sends a messenger to Guillaume Cal, who is with this group of Jacques, to say, hey, come talk to me, Guillaume Cal goes. And he doesn't tell Navarre that he wants hostages to guarantee his safety when he goes. And this is a major miscalculation. Charles of Navarre just imprisons him and beheads him. Then Navarre's noble forces attack, and again, the Jacques are cut to pieces. And this is really the turning point. It is not the end of the Jacquerie, which really goes on for another month, really, but it's the beginning of the end. And it's this at this point when the Jacques' allies in the provincial towns begin to have regrets about supporting the Jacques as they have done. And this is really bad for the rebels because they don't have any defensive infrastructure. They need to be able to fall back behind city walls, but they are finding city walls closed to them. The only city that remains on their side is Saint-Lys. Saint-Lys remains loyal to the cause beyond the fall of Paris um, and never really suffers any repercussions for that. But after that double defeat, at Mo and by um, the King of Navarre, the nobles regained their courage. And they had been hiding out in forests and in castles. And they're like, actually, you know what? We can take these guys after all. And so what began as sort of a social revolt at the end of May from the middle of June becomes more of a social war. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of what was a difficult part to read in the book, especially because you have the Jacques who are like, let's try and do this by the book. Even when they have executions, they're like, we're going to have an official executioner. He's, we're going to hire him. He's going to do a good job. But then once the tide turns against them, the nobles don't have the same compunctions about their safety. And it's awful the retaliation that happens. Yeah, I mean, they they do, you know, even chroniclers who are approving of the nobles and of them, so we call the, the reprisals, the counter jackery, even chroniclers who approve of this. So like, yeah, they just, they hung the innocent along with the guilty from any tree they found because they didn't have time to do justice. Yeah. The Jacques are famous for raping women, but the only actual corroborated reports of sexual violence we have come from the counter jacquerie and some people got killed just for having said something that sounded a little critical of nobles not even for for taking part themselves plenty of noble of villages just got burned to the ground so it was very violent retaliation mm -hmm. do you think this was done in the name of justice because we were talking about the judiciary identity of lords do you think that this yeah. do you think that they thought to themselves this was for justice or you think that that was <laughs> that they couldn't even really hide behind that i think some of them did i think certainly in one case we have a couple of noblemen who had actually to get a pardon from the crown because they had gone out and you know were killing people and burning things down and doing it in the king's name which, you know, you're, you're not actually supposed to do unless you actually have a commission from the king. So, you know, there's, there's at least an effort there to behave in a sort of legalistic way. 
It's really not until the fall of Paris and the reestablishment of royal government in Paris from the 10th of August that you start to have legal forms. You know, if, if people were holding trials in July, then there would be records, but there aren't. The only thing we have from July actually is a report of a man who was found actually by the Dauphin's army beheaded and his property seized. So again, no trials. And, and I think a lot of people were just summarily executed by their lords mm-hmm. yeah. or by passing nobles in, in many cases. Yeah, it's tragic and really interesting when you look at the way in which both of these, the Jacquerie and the Counter Jacquerie, conducted themselves. It's really interesting. We could probably talk about that for way too long. But tell us, <laughs> tell us how Paris fell because it didn't look, it didn't look that good for Charles the Prince until it did. <laughs> it was no, kind of no. Sudden. I mean, he was actually so um, he had gone to Mo, this castle that had been defended, and he got his wife and baby back, and that was nice. And he had spent a lot of July trying to take Paris back. Um, He had been camped sort of southeast of the city, but it hadn't worked out. And his troops had been very violent in their own right, which made everybody upset. So he was in Mo and he was like, well, this is not working out. So he had gotten his carts packed up and he was going to go down to the Dauphiné where the weather is nicer and maybe his subjects would like him better. Um, And he was all packed and ready to go. And suddenly news comes from Paris to say Etienne Marcel has been killed. There has been a counter coup in Paris. And this had been brewing for a lot of July, partly because the King of Navarre's troops had been allowed into the city and had been very rough with the city's inhabitants. And because it was rumored that Etienne Marcel was actually in favor of Charles of Navarre becoming king, which, you know, that that was a step too far for many people. That's actual treason. So at the end of July, he was assassinated. Many of his close associates were assassinated and letters were sent to Prince Charles. Come back, our beloved friends. Yeah. Um, you know, we are, we are your loyal subjects are ready, ready to welcome <laughs> you. He comes back in this, you know, triumphant procession and he makes some examples, some um, very brutal examples in the public square. You know, he has one of the reform orators tongues torn out before, you know, drawing and quartering him, that kind of thing. But then he draws a line under it. On the 10th of August, he issues a general remission to both people who have been involved in the rebellion in Paris, to people involved in the Jacquerie, and to people involved in the counter Jacquerie, interestingly, because they also needed to be forgiven for these things they had done that were, you know, against the law. So there are still rumors over the course of that fall and winter, and, and Charles is always traumatized by this. He's paranoid for the rest of his life. There are rumors that supporters of the reform movement are about to stage another coup in October and a lot of people are arrested. And some of it does go underground, at least in Paris. And you find echoes of it in later revolts in the early 1380s and in 1413. But yet Charles wins kind of against all odds, very surprisingly. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's kind of impressive how he comes out on top and then he can just ride in and say, listen, I forgive all of you as if as if he had control, you know, even yeah. a week before, even days before, which he didn't. And yeah, it's it's a crazy story from start to finish. Really. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I think it really confirms him in his sense that he is God's chosen one, right? I mean, yeah, this is providence. This is obviously the hand of God. And at least it sobers him up a bit, this whole experience. Charles does go on to be a good king, not one who's particularly careful of the safety of people in the countryside, it must be said. But, you know, he's one of France's famous kings. If you've ever benefited from the Bibliothèque Nationale, the kernel of that library is Charles's library. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's well praised by Christine de Pisan and all sorts of people. So things turned out great for Charles. (laughs) 
it turns out. <laughs> yeah. And, you, you know, you just, you made a parallel with the English Peasants Revolt too. And this, it's so familiar too, where Richard comes out looking great after feeling great. Like this is a confirmation of my divinity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's strange and, and so complex as you've gone at in the book. Now, before I let you go, everybody these days is trying to draw parallels between the 14th mm. century and today. And one of the ways that they do that is through these peasants' revolts. So the one in England and the Jacquerie as well. So what would you say to this? Like, are you seeing anything that connects it? Are you seeing it as being very distinctly different? What are you seeing in response to all these hot mm. takes? <laughs> okay. Well, okay. So first of all, there's a lot that is, of course, very different. And certainly it's been interesting writing I started the book in like 2013. And then, you know, the, the sort of populist tidal waves of 2016 happened with the Brexit vote and then the Trump vote. And then in the summer of 2020, Black Lives Matter it happened. At each of these points, people have said, oh, is it a parallel with our time now? And okay, so as you can tell, you know, the, the, the politics is, all, is, of course, all over the place. But in some ways, the modalities of mobilization are somewhat similar. OK, so in order to get people to act, you have to have a long background of preparation, one of the things I did in the book was I talked about the sociologist Charles Tilley's work on, on how do you mobilize in these mass events of destruction. And you see that in the Jacquerie, but you also see, and, and I think we see also in our own experience, that there is often a catalyzing moment. You know, whether it is a group of nobles riding into a village or a video of police brutality. And it's that moment where things can crystallize and begin to move in ways that you wouldn't have expected maybe even a day before. So, you know, I, I think that that has some interesting parallels. The other thing that I think has some interesting parallels is what motivates people? And again, you know, I want to emphasize the politics are very, very different. Mm -hmm. But what motivated people with the Jacquerie and indeed with the English Peasants' Revolt, and I think with some of our popular uprisings today, is obvious hypocrisy on the part of elites. That's when that social contract really breaks down. You know, when you get that moment when the moral economy is obviously bankrupt. And when people have said, maybe I'm not all right with where I am, but you know, this is a meritocracy. So I know if I work hard, it'll be all right. Or, you know, I know we've got a way to go on race relations, but we're getting there. You know, and it's, it's those moments when it becomes really clear that actually the social contract has been broken that people undertake means of redress that are outside the system, that are outside institutions. So I, I think that in, in both those ways. Okay, and the third way, this is the last, this is the, last <laughs> thing, the experience of trauma. So the people who undertook the Jacquerie revolt, and I, one thing we haven't talked about is there's nothing like this in French history up to this point. This is, this is sui generis, it is new for peasants to do this on this kind of scale. These are people who survived the Black Death. You know, they had lived through the unimaginable. And I, I think that, you know, this is not something a historian can prove, but you know, that, that shakes something loose in people. And they begin to, to think about their world in a different way and think, okay, well, what other things could be possible? Maybe something good could be possible as well. <laughs> you know, and maybe, you know, our death toll, thank goodness, is much lower than the Black Death. The Black Death, we can't imagine losing 50% of the population over the course of three years, right? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I hope that stays unimaginable. Mm -hmm. um, so these people had lived through a much more traumatic experience than even we have, but you know, we are all collectively traumatized. And it will be interesting to see over the next few years as we hopefully move beyond the acute phase of that trauma, what that does to our imaginations. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is so insightful and a, just a beautiful way to end. That. <laughs> uh, I mean, I love how you haven't you haven't said it's so simple. You know, you live through trauma, and then <laughs> and then there is a revolution, and then everything's fine because it's not <laughs> it's not how history works. But no, history is complex. <laughs> <laughs> but learning, well, investigating this kind of event, I think, is so useful. And you've done such a brilliant job with the book. Congratulations on the book, and yeah. thank you so much for talking to us about the Jacques Green oh, today. Oh, pleasure. Really enjoyed it. To find out more about Justine's work, you can visit her page at the University of St. Andrews at st, that's st, hyphen andrews dot ac dot uk slash history slash people slash jmfb. Or you can follow her on Twitter at Medieval Revolt. That's the British spelling of medieval with the A in it. Her new book is The Jacquerie of 1358, A French Peasant's Revolt. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on this week, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, I guess in the news, there's been a gold penny discovered in England. It, it was minted by Henry III. Some guy found it. It's going up for auction. Like is it, The auctions already have happened by the time this podcast goes out. But they're expecting it to sell for as much as 400,000 pounds. Wow. And it's a penny. <laughs> it's just a penny. Metal detectorist walking. That's the only thing he found was that one penny just sitting in the field. Someone's going to be happy. A couple oh. of people will be very happy, I think, at, at this weekend. Definitely. That's your dream, isn't it? To take a metal detector and find something amazing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm hoping to go to England uh, this. I have to go to England this summer for a, a couple of conferences, and I'm hoping to do like one day of metal detectoring. So <laughs> if, any of, if any of my listeners out there want to drag me over fields. <laughs> You drag you over fields or drag yeah. a metal detector over fields? Well, give me my detector. I'll walk with you. All right. Go back and forth. <laughs> I'm sure we'll find a new horde. Yeah, I'm sure. I will keep my fingers crossed for you. What else is going on? Hey, well, so we have a new a column on the website. A new columnist. His name is Matthew Terrio, and his beat is going to be video games in the Middle Ages. Nice. I remember I got into med medieval history through video games, and I don't really kind of deal with it too much anymore, but I've only looked at the first one to actually write about it and how video games show off the Middle Ages, how they interpret it, things like that. So uh, I'm really excited. So Matthew's the kind of first piece is going to look at what's called like Forex strategy games, which is like civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can check that on the website. And also, I want to actually uh, mention one of your podcast colleagues, Byzantium and Friends with Anthony. Mm -hmm. He has a new episode about the religion of simple believers. And it's an interview with Jack Tanos. And they're talking about the kind of early Byzantine ideas of what, what what did like the common person think about religion? Because you know, we tend to get focused like what did what do all these bishops and saints and like monastic leaders have to say? But what did like the average person think? What was their faith? So I love I thought, that. Yeah, it was a really good episode. I really enjoyed it. So I wanted to just plug that as well. Well, Anthony is great. And if people haven't checked out Byzantium and Friends, then they should check it out because Anthony has all sorts of great guests and they talk about the Roman Empire and how it flourished after it supposedly fell. So thanks, Peter, for giving Anthony a shout out. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you to all of our patrons on Patreon.com for your support each month. We have great stuff for patrons like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, our book club, and our exclusive maps by Tina Ross. And you also get that warm and fuzzy feeling for helping Medievalist.net's podcasters to keep bringing you fun historical content, including this podcaster. So thank you. To find out how to get your own warm and fuzzies, please visit Patreon.com slash Medievalists. For everything from peasants to plays, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabolski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can even get hold of my latest book, How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. 
Thanks for listening and have yourself an amazing day. Bye.